Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Scott Sagan, professor of political science and co-director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation here at Stanford University. Uh, we have uh, many people here in the room and many, many more people uh, on Zoom today. And I want to welcome you to this session on reducing nuclear danger featuring William J. Perry. We will, following Dr. Perry's remarks, he'll take a few questions and comments, and then we're, he will be presented by Jonathan Granoff uh, with the Cranston Award from the Global Security Institute. Um, after that, we will have a panel discussing nuclear risk with Governor Jerry Brown, Professor Marty Hellman, Ambassador Rose Gottemuller will be standing here on the stage, and they will also take Q&A uh, from the audience. So we'll be having roving mics and having uh, comments coming in through the Zoom uh, Q&A function as well. So without further ado, let me introduce Secretary William Perry. Um, it is the norm to comment about uh, Bill Perry having a distinguished career. Bill Perry did not have a distinguished career. He had multiple distinguished careers. He had a distinguished career as an entrepreneur and businessman here in Silicon Valley. He had a distinguished career as a public servant, going back from young days, passing on information uh, that was crucial for the Cuban Missile Crisis and later for anti-ballistic missile systems understandings of what was going on in then the Soviet Union. He was undersecretary, deputy secretary, and then finally the 19th Secretary of Defense. Bill Perry had a distinguished career as a teacher, serving here at CSAC as a co-director, as a longtime chair of our board, and teaching through his course on technology and national security literally thousands of Stanford undergraduates and graduate students who got interested in national security through that process, many of whom have gone on, and I see them when we're in Washington, you can see alumni of Bill Perry's programs. And lastly, I would say, since he has retired, he's had a dis distinguished career as a public intellectual, continuing on his education mission beyond Stanford to the global stage, writing books, writing many articles, making podcasts. He's tireless in his dedication. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming William J. Perry. Thank you, Scott, for that truly wonderful introduction. Beyond what Scott has already told you, let me add something to that, uh, which is, I think, most significant about me, is I am a child of the Cold War, a child of the Cold War. Just two weeks after I received my degree in mathematics from Stanford, a large North Korean army, equipped by the Soviet Union, invaded South Korea. They captured Seoul in a few days and quickly moved toward Pusan, the southern tip of South Korea. To the surprise of everyone, and particularly to the surprise of Joseph Stalin, President Truman ordered American troops in to stop the invasion. They, and he also began a call up of the U.S. Army Reserve. That was especially significant to me because at the same time I received my degree from Stanford, I also was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army. So I, many, many months, I went very anxiously to my mailbox each day to see if my call up order was there, which happily for me, it, it never came. So a completion of my years as a student at Stanford coincided with the beginning of the Cold War. As a result, I experienced personally all of the dangerous crises of the Cold War. I was deeply involved in this most dangerous crisis, which is the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
in which we were terrifyingly close to ending civilization in the global nuclear war. And I remember vividly the time we went to DEFCON 2 over the Suez Canal crisis. In short, I had a ringside seat to the most dangerous moments of the Cold War. I was always fearing that it would end finally in an existential catastrophe. So I will never, ever forget the thrill I felt when I saw the videos of the German youth tearing down the Berlin Wall. The Cold War was over. We had somehow survived all of its perilous moments. And I was confident, confident that we would never again be so mindless as to start another Cold War. But I was wrong. Russia and the United States are now engaged in a second Cold War. The crisis in Ukraine, I believe, is the most dangerous we have faced since the Cuban Missile Crisis. This existential danger was precipitated when Vladimir Putin ordered his army to invade Ukraine. As much as I care about the fate of Ukraine, and I do deeply, I must emphasize that his actions endanger more than Ukraine. What is at stake is the implicit world order that somehow has got us through the Cold War. How do I define this world order? In my view, it has two essential components. One is that no country would ever invade another country for the sake of expanding its national boundaries. And secondly, no nuclear power would ever use or threaten to use its nuclear arsenal except for the purpose of deterrence. The first component we had to come to take for granted, but I must remind you of how different that is from history, particularly in the history that I led, which many of you are not old enough to live during the 1930s. Japan invaded and seized Manchuria. Italy invaded and seized Ethiopia. Russia invaded and tried unsuccessfully to invade, to seize Finland. And Germany invaded and seized Czechoslovakia. All that happened in about a five year period in the 1930s. All the while, the world deplored these actions, but by doing nothing, accepted them. But when Germany invaded Poland, Britain and France had finally said, this is enough. They declared war in Germany and World War II was underway. After World War II, with its catastrophic consequences and with the understanding of how much more catastrophic a war with nuclear weapons would be, there was a never again moment, never again. Countries vowed that it would never ever be a World War III. And for 77 years, they have kept that vow. There have been smaller scale wars to be sure, but these wars were not about one country seizing land from another country. And with one notable exception, of course, which was when Iraq invaded Kuwait. And that met an immediate response from the international community with the coalition that formed and defeated Iraq and, and captured its ruler. None of these smaller scale wars escalated and none entailed the use of nuclear weapons or the threat of use of nuclear weapons. This unique, let's look back at this 77 years. This was a uniquely peaceful period in the history of the world. And that ended when Russia invaded Ukraine. This magnificent period for whatever it was worth, whatever positive and negative values it had, it's now ended. And if Russia is successful, they may take future actions to further restore the boundaries of Imperial Russia, which include, for example, Moldova and the Baltic countries. If that were to happen, the world would be back to the 1930s, when powerful countries used military force to enlarge their own boundaries. But it is, an, it is not clear that Russia will be successful to everybody's surprise. The Russian army has been surprisingly inept. 
the Ukrainian army, although outnumbered and outgunned, has been surprisingly effective. Most countries have deplored the actions of Russia, and many countries, including our own, have supplied Ukraine with weapons, some of which have been used to great effect by the Ukrainian army. But no country has been willing to send its own military forces to Ukraine. No country. In a sense, the countries that deplore the invasion see it as a threat to Ukraine, but not as a threat to world order, which is what I believe that it is. So I want to make that sharp distinction. It's more than a threat to Ukraine. It is a threat to our world order. If Russia's invasion is successful, we should expect to see other invasions. The precedent has now been set. The second component, as I define it, of the post-World War II order has been that nuclear weapons are used only for deterrence. And that is also in danger of being lost. Putin and his foreign minister have both hinted darkly that they would use nuclear weapons under some circumstances that have nothing to do with nuclear deterrence. And other nations have taken that quite seriously. Many countries, including our own, have not, have not let us stop them from supplying Ukraine with financial support and with effective modern weapons. But no country, including our own, has provided them with combat troops. We could, for example, use our air combat units to enforce, an, enforce a no-fly zone over Ukraine, which some have suggested. The American Air Force could effectively enforce such a zone, and this would save the lives of many civilians who are being indiscriminately bombarded by the Russian Air Force. There are many reasons why the President has decided not to do that. Many reasons, I'm sure. But certainly a paramount reason is that we take seriously Putin's threat to use nuclear weapons, which in turn could conceivably use lead to a general nuclear war. Let's pause a moment and see what significance of that. He's using the threat of using nuclear weapons to deter our use of conventional forces. There's no precedent for that in history, none at all. But that's what's happening now. In effect, we are self-deterred because we fear Putin may use his nukes in a way not considered by anyone during the Cold War. I am not making an argument for any specific US military action. I fully understand the possible consequences of such an action, but I am raising what I think is a very fundamental question. If in this new world, Putin decides he can take any military action he chooses, and if he threatens to use his nukes, if we interfere in any way, will we always be deterred. If he is free to undertake any aggressive military action, knowing that we will not respond with our conventional forces for fear that he would go nuclear, that seems to be the issue. We are in a new world now, a new world, where the logic of nuclear deterrence is no longer the issue. It is a world where Putin takes what we actions we consider unacceptable with his conventional forces, and we cannot respond with our conventional forces because he threatens to go nuclear if we do. That is the situation in some that we are confronted with today. We are deterred by the prospect of the use of nuclear weapons, but Putin is not. This, I believe, is a serious asymmetry, and one that I believe is unacceptable. For many decades, I believed that neither of our leaders would use nuclear weapons first, that the real danger of a nuclear war was through accident, miscalculation, or through a deranged leader. That is no longer true. Putin is threatening to use nuclear weapons if we use conventional weapons to assist Ukraine. Well, I have described a new way in which a nuclear war could start. This is clearly an important 
new security danger. I have to confess that I do not know how the United States should deal with this new nuclear danger, but I am sure that it should not be in giving Putin a free hand to take any aggressive action he might choose to take. I'm reluctant to recommend any actions in Ukraine that could test how serious Putin is about his threat of the use of nuclear weapons or how readily his military establishment might respond to such an order. But I fear that if we give in to this outrageous threat, we will face it again and again. So I'm going to leave you with a provocative question. Is this the time, is this the time to call, to call Putin on his threat in Ukraine, where the issues of right and wrong are really quite clear? Thank you. Bill has agreed to take just a few questions before we have the award and then we have the panel. So if we could have microphones come forward. A question here in the front first. Well, my voice is probably loud enough. Well, but the people are on Zoom, so you do have to wait. Ah, okay. This is first here and then right next door. So I agree with you that uh, I feel the most threatened uh, of nuclear since uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. But what worries me the most is that Putin is not gonna lose. If things get so bad, uh, he's so it, crazy that he will use at least small nuclear weapons in Ukraine. And then what happens after that? Yeah, the, uh, you, you raised the most fundamental question possible to which I do not have an answer. I also simply want to point out this is a new problem. It's a very dangerous problem. Putin very clearly sees he has us. He's taking actions he knows we would try to stop, want to stop. We would like to help Ukraine more than we are helping them. But he also knows that by threatening to use nuclear weapons, that's going to deter us. So we're in this untenable, what I consider untenable position which if you generalize and say he can do anything he wants to do, I mean, we cannot respond because we fear that he will threaten using nuclear weapons. That's, I just find it's an unacceptable situation. It's an issue that we'll be discussing in the panel since we discussed this quite a bit earlier today. So next question, please. If you could introduce yourself, just tell Secretary Perry who you are each time when we go around. Hi, my name is, oh, that's loud. Wow. Hi, my name is Aiden Fay. I am an undergraduate, just about to graduate, uh, mechanical engineering. Um, I, like many people, am extremely concerned about what's been going on. Um, but many of my generation seem not to be, which is quite disturbing to me. Um, one of the things that I often hear is, ah, oh, it's, you know, it's not as bad as what, you know, when our parents were, were kids, you know, it's nothing like, uh, they always bring up the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, People often say, well, this is the worst since the Cuban Missile Crisis, but how does this compare in of itself? You know, maybe per hour it might not be as risky, but this is going on for much longer. Um, how do you assess the likelihood of an intentional nuclear war versus, you know, sort of an unintentional escalation? I think that will be discussed later on in the panel. Marty Hellman has something to say about what he thinks the probability of a nuclear war has been and how it has been changed by that. So rather than try to answer that now, I'm gonna to defer to Marty when we, get to, when we get to the panel talk. Thank you. That, would, that, that question will be specifically addressed. Question in the back here. Uh, my name is Robert Klein. Uh, I'm in the affordable housing field, but I'm a former board member of the Global Security Institute. Uh, given the premise that was stated earlier that Putin faced with a complete and unexplainable loss could use tactical nuclear weapons, <clears throat> um, what is the possibility that there is some strategic benefit in looking at what happened in 1971 when Taiwan was removed from the Security Council by a majority vote 
<coughs> of the General Assembly. Uh, because uh, Russia is in the same position. They're not the same country that got the original seat in the Security Council. If they were removed by a majority vote and a UN interventionary force was sent in, uh, <clears throat> could Putin actually view this as potentially uh, mitigating or explaining away his loss to a point that he doesn't feel desperate enough to use tactical nuclear weapons uh, because this force would intervene, create a buffer, stabilize the situation, <clears throat> and not create a total loss that uh, he would view as ending his life and uh, his uh, control and authority. There's an awful lot wrapped up in that question, which I will not have time to address now, but let me make a few, a few points. Uh, first is I'm always concerned when people talk about tactical nuclear weapons or small nuclear weapons, because the term is so misleading, the adjectives are so misleading. A small nuclear weapon might be, have the destructive power of maybe a hundred of the biggest bombs, the conventional bombs we have, the, a hundred of them at one. That's what we're calling it. A tactical nuclear weapon could destroy a city like Palo Alto, just like that. So the word tactical is, is just highly, highly misleading. Um, the other question, the other part of your question is uh, too complicated really for me to try to handle in, in a short time. I was thinking that maybe Scott might be able to make a comment on, on one of them, since this, since this is an area where he, is, he has worked and studied extensively. Scott, do you feel a little well, on, on the Security Council question, remember Taiwan left willingly because there was a replacement. Uh, and so it was considered that that is the, is the government. I don't think Russia would react, um, and it's not clear to me. One of the many shocking things that's happened in this war has been the unification of NATO and expansion of NATO because of it. But many people in the United Nations system have not a, stood up against the Russians. It's been surprising how many people, sometimes in the global south, almost sometimes Russian allies, but it's not clear that a move like that in the United Nations would end with just a resignation of, of Russia. I think it would end with the end of the United Nations. I would, I would concur with Scott's assessment on that. Yeah. Well, now we're going to turn to the second part, which is uh, to have Jonathan Granoff of the Global Security Institute explain the Alan Cranston Peace Award and then give it to Bill Perry. Scott, thank you, uh, Dr. Sagan. Thank you so much for touching on the extraordinary career of Dr. Perry and uh, taking a lot of thunder out of my speech. <laughs> but I want to point out a few significant things, uh, and there are many more that we could point out. When Dr. Perry was Secretary of Defense, he instituted the doctrine of preventive de defense not aggressive defense, not threatening defense, but preventive defense. He traveled abroad more than any other Secretary of Defense in history because he knew that human contact was the most important aspect of the security amongst nations and people. He even addressed the Russian Duma directly on the importance of arms control. He had a solution to the threat of North Korea because he treated everybody with the way he's treated many of us here today, with extraordinary respect and dignity, the same qualities that many of us saw in another Stanford alum, Senator Alan Cranston. Senator Cranston in 1939 
was sued for violating American copyright law. He had published an annotated version of Mein Kampf. He was sued by Hitler and his team. He lost the suit, but before then, he had distributed over 500,000 copies. He helped warn us. In 1948, he met Albert Einstein, who explained to him the threat that nuclear weapons posed. And he concluded, and this was a guiding principle of his life, that nuclear weapons are unworthy of civilization. In 2000, he, uh, no, in 1999, he concluded that it would be worthwhile to form an institute that would be focused on the abolition of nuclear weapons and thus founded the Global Security Institute. Its chairman, Kim Cranston, is here with us today. And one of the gifts that we're going to give Dr. Perry is The Sovereignty Revolution, published by Stanford University Press, and signed, uh, and the authors of this book are uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, not bad, Jane Goodall, commenting on Senator Cranston's uh, core essay on addressing the issue of sovereignty and security, core to the issue before us today with Ukraine. But most important to me, and from what I've seen in my, in my inspiring a journey that has inspired me with Dr. Perry uh, has been his incredibly energizing, informing character as an exemplary citizen. Because he's tireless in educating people at every level. So I commend to everyone's attention the William Perry Project, which is, uh, which is really husbanded by his family. And then he makes other people who are not his blood family feel family. And that's exactly what Senator Cranston did. It's not, well, it's not easy to find someone to give the, uh, the Alan Cranston Peace Award to, because there's just not many people who are leaders in this, in this way. The best way that I could describe the kind of leadership that Dr. Perry has given us was stated by the ancient Chinese sage Lao Tzu, who said, a leader is best when people barely know that he exists, less good when they obey and acclaim him, worse when they fear and despise him. Fail to honor people, and they will fail to honor you. But if a good leader when his work is done and his aim fulfilled, they will all say, we did it ourselves. And this is exactly the kind of leadership that Dr. William Perry has exemplified over many decades, and we hope for many, many more years. So in recognition of his sustained and inspiring service to the security, peace, and well-being of the United States and the world, and I would like to ask uh, Senator Cranston's son, who was the editor of the book, to come up and just present it with me to Dr. Perry. Oh, and by the way, this conference that Dr. Sagan has invited an incredibly wonderful group of experts together. Everybody put their signature on the back with respect and gratitude. So that will, in the way of Dr. Perry, that will subtly be behind the picture. Now, the next section of the talk uh, will be a, a panel um, on nuclear risk. 
Um, and our speakers will be Ambassador Rose Gottemuller, Professor Martin Hellman, and also Governor Jerry Brown. And I believe we have Governor Brown speaking first, and is he able to come up on Zoom right now? Ah, Governor Brown, welcome. It's very good to have you here today. I hope um, you can unmute yourself, and uh, I hope you had a chance to hear Dr. Perry. Thank you for joining us. Governor Brown, the floor thank, is yours. Thank you. I hope you can see me. It looks a little washed out from, from this angle. Anyway, um, a very uh, heartfelt talk uh, by Bill Perry, and I hesitate to uh, try to uh, add uh, or push beyond his points uh, since he refrained from giving us a, uh, a quick answer as to what next. Uh, are we going to be deterred uh, by Russia or are we going to forge ahead in a forceful way? Well, uh, yeah, we are deterred about from nuclear, but maybe Mr. Putin is deterred by our potential nuclear response. So all I can say is I, I hope uh, that our military and the Ukraine military and NATO and all the rest can supply the weaponry and the intelligence, um, the strategy uh, to push Putin back and then to be able to open up channels uh, that would allow for some kind of, of an arrangement, some kind of ending uh, short of uh, whatever the military could bring about. Because I assume if we keep going, either Russians get pushed back or they don't get pushed back and the Ukrainians get pushed back. So uh, I think as has been said, uh, this is fraught with danger. Uh, I don't know that anybody has a quick solution other than uh, we're not ready yet for uh, introduction of troops. Uh, there's an awful lot that is being done and that can be done and keep that going. Uh, but at the same time, uh, looking for intermediaries. Uh, to be able to see if someone can't talk some sense into Putin and find some off-ramp, if that's at all possible. And uh, I can't say that. Macron keeps uh, meeting with Putin. Some people think he's very foolish. Uh, I think that's at least a, a positive. Where it will go, I don't know. But I would say this. While the experts, and Rose Gottman is here, so she may have some uh, more uh, informed uh, an expert opinion on where we might go vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and Russia. But in the meantime, uh, the U.S. is ramping up its conflict with China uh, and keeping the Trump policies, the tariffs, uh, the, uh, I think, a range of uh, adversarial moves, not the least of which is defining uh, China in very Manichaean terms. Uh, not to say that China is some paragon of virtue, far from it. But all the countries of the world have their, have their own uh, infirmities. And I think one of the things that is missing is some degree of clarity uh, about the situation of the world and uh, greater humility uh, on, on the uh, US part. I mean, if we can believe the Brown University cost of war study, the 20 years of war uh, uh, launched first by uh, George Bush and continued for 20 years uh, by all the combatants resulted in 900,000 deaths, uh, at least 37 million people um, displaced from their homes and how many trillions, uh, maybe 5 trillion. But all that shows colossal uh, error, a mistake, uh, really some dumb moves. And if not in ab initio, uh, then uh, year after year after year. So I think it's good that we have a more honest reflection on the mistakes that we've made. And certainly over the decades, we've been involved in a lot of things, at least from my point of view uh, and, and others, uh, really call for honest re-examination. So uh, toward that end with China, yes, China is pushing. Yes, there's, we know the litany of, of things we don't like about China. Nevertheless, uh, it's not going away. And uh, the result, uh, the focus in, in the US in Washington is particularly, is mostly military. Now there's some talk of uh, there's working with the Quad and other things in, in Asia, but uh, there's no big economic 
alternative or agenda to the to the uh, trading prowess of China. And America's gonna have to put up some, some real money, some real trade uh, opportunities that I don't see it doing. And I know politically, uh, the China imports are, are not liked by labor. And uh, certainly the conservative side of the fence doesn't like China either. There's never been greater hostility, greater than toward Russia. So trying to work any modus vivendi, any kind of coexistence with China is not gonna be uh, easy. But I think it's worth trying a lot harder and a lot more creatively than I've seen to date. The, the name calling, uh, the escalation of uh, rhetorical denunciation does not help. Uh, somehow, uh, a country with 25% of the world's population, or 23%, and all the economic and military muscle that it has and will have calls uh, for, I think, uh, a more creative policy than I see today. So, and the big issues, whether it's uh, something we don't hear much about, uh, but in a recent book, Fred Berkston, a real expert on global lost you, Governor Brown. Am I back? You are back. I'm back. Okay. So uh, in a recent book, uh, U.S. China versus China by Fred Berkson, a real expert on the field of economics, he's saying that we avoided, we, America, the world, China, avoided a global 1930 depression style because China and the U.S. were able to partner and put in the investment to counter the recession. He expects more uh, recessions in the future. And if China and the US can't partner, we could face a 1930s type of depression. So that's the economic management. Then you have the climate, which is uh, more than is generally acknowledged, getting more and more serious. That's gonna make everything worse. And there is some, uh, com there is some dialogue with China and some potential. Then of course, you've got the nuclear, which. China is not ready to talk about because they're so far behind us. And then you have the whole field of scientific cooperation. There are areas of uh, commonality that have to be forged. And I don't think uh, the US policy is open enough and creative enough uh, to forge those paths. And I think whatever our conflict with Russia is, it may turn out to uh, go tactical nuclear and who knows where that will go. I think we can face an even greater threat from China. And that's certainly the way it's being defined in Washington. But I don't think their policy is realistic. I don't think it's creative. I don't think it's designed in a way that will uh, produce some positive results. And I would just cite, if I might, Henry Kissinger, who just in a recent interview in the Financial Times said that defining uh, our uh, China in solely adversarial terms is a real mistake. And at the same time, he mentioned that the weapons that now exist have uh, their, the destructiveness is so unimaginable that that's another reason why we have to come together as earthlings, as people on this earth. It's what I call planetary realism. That's opposed to what I call crackpot realism, which is just 19th century uh, nationalism, uh, you know, updated uh, for 2022. So I can't say that what I'm suggesting is right because we live in a world of uncertainty. But I do think there uh, are real deficiencies in the current uh, Biden policy toward China. And I think uh, we need much greater openness uh, to finding some uh, common ground before uh, we get with China to where we are now with Russia. Great, well, thank you very much. Our next, our next pa panelist is Ambassador Rose Gottemuller. Thank you very much, Dr. Sagan. It's such an honor to be on this stage with Dr. Bill Perry. We worked together so closely in the Clinton administration and it was always an honor. I was laughing, Bill, when the remark was made that you traveled more than any other Secretary of Defense. And I remember I wasn't on every one of those trips, but I was on a few of them that you took to the former Soviet Union. And you were so important to the safe handling of the Soviet nuclear arsenal after the breakup of the Soviet Union and how we work so closely with the Russians, with the Ukrainians, the Kazakhstanis, with the Belarusians, with everyone across that territory to ensure that that nuclear arsenal and the fissile material uh, 
did not fall into the wrong hands. So I think our entire country and the globe owes you a debt of gratitude for all the work that you did on cooperative threat reduction. So thank you. Thank you from me, too. Got some pretty interesting trips in that way, including I don't think I was there the day that you actually planted the sunflower seeds on the old ICBM silo, but I was there when they actually, the Ukrainians popped open the silo and we saw the missile before it was withdrawn. Many of you may not know about those programs from the 1990s, but we used the existence of the first Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, the START Treaty, after it entered into force in 1994. The measures therein for, uh, for monitoring and verification and handling of the missiles and so forth and elimination of the missiles. We used them at that time. We used the tool of the START Treaty to get rid of the nuclear uh, weapon systems that were left in, in Kazakhstan and Ukraine and Belarus. So happy to talk more about that period, but it was a great, I think, uh, policy innovation and, and certainly Bill Perry and his Harvard colleagues did a lot to put that in place even before the start of the Clinton administration. So it was a major step forward. But I know nowadays there are a lot of controversies about the Budapest Memorandum. And uh, this, again, was part of the suite of documents that, uh, that was used in order to bring, uh, bring forward the policy of ensuring that the nuclear weapons that were left on territory outside of Russia uh, should uh, essentially be eliminated according to the, the START Treaty so that instead of having four nuclear weapon states emerge from the breakup of the Soviet Union, we would only have one and that one successor state was uh, the Russian Federation. Again, it's, it's controversial today, I realize, and there's a lot of argumenting, argumentation over it, but I want to just give you my point of view on it very quickly, and that is that I see that step in 1994 as having bought Ukraine almost 30 years of stability in order to develop as a sovereign independent state and to partner closely with major institutions. Uh, I will just mention the European Union and NATO. I think the effectiveness of the, of the Ukrainian army today is basically rooted in that sovereignty, independence, that sense of nationhood that developed out of that almost 30 years of stability that we bought uh, for Ukraine. In addition, then the close working relationships, this training that the Ukrainians have undergone, particularly since the seizure of Crimea in 2014, training in partnership with NATO and with individual NATO countries such as Canada, I'll mention, United States, of course, but some other NATO countries as well. We see that, that effectiveness on the battlefield. So it's the combination of Ukrainian independence taking shape after 1994, but also the interaction with European institutions and other international institutions that I think uh, has brought us to the point we are today where Ukraine is defending itself against an egregious invasion of its territory by the Russian Federation. So that is how I see it. I also see the negative flip side if Ukraine had insisted on holding on to its nuclear weapons in 1994, and oh, by the way, Kazakhstan and Belarus perhaps, perhaps following suit, we would have instead seen 30 years of instability and importantly, nuclear instability in the former Soviet space. So I will just leave it at that. Happy again to discuss. It's a controversial argument at this moment, but I'll be interested to hear how others are reacting to it. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Professor Hellman. Thank you, Professor Sagan. We don't usually use those terms. So first of all, it's an honor to be here uh, honoring uh, my friend and colleague, Bill Perry, and implicitly Alan Cranston, uh, just as uh, Tyler Wick Stevenson, who some of you know, uh, was influenced by Senator Cranston, and all the people in the audience who I see who have worked on these issues. Uh, so it, it's really a, a pro, an honor and a privilege. Since Bill uh, deferred your question about the what's the risk of a nuclear war, I'll start with that. I published a paper uh, March of last year, so uh, 14 months ago, uh, in the Bolton, the Atomic Scientist. If you go to my Stanford website, Google Hellman Stanford, it'll come up, go to publications, go down to the most, one of the most recent ones, you'll find it. In that paper, I explain why to an order of magnitude, which as an engineer you'll understand, 
uh, but for everyone else, the same means very approximately. Uh, to an order of magnitude, uh, the risk of a nuclear war then, not today, was approximately 1% per year. It wasn't 10% a year, it wasn't a tenth of a percent per year. I won't go into the arguments here, there's not enough time. Uh, and Bill, uh, I saw him in June of last year and at his apartment, and he told me he agreed with me. I sent him an email saying, can I quote you on that? And he said, yes. So you have not only me saying it, but a former Secretary of Defense, a PhD in mathematics, by the way, so he understands numbers, uh, agreeing that a year ago, the risk was approximately 1% per year. It could have been 2 or 3%, it could have been a half or a third percent, but it wasn't 10 times smaller or 10 times larger. Today, it's harder to say what the risk is. It's clearly larger with the war in Ukraine. Uh, and I would guess, and this is more of a guess because we don't know everything that's going on, I can actually justify the 1% a year, and I do in the paper uh, that you can see. Today, I would guess that it's closer to 1% per month. Uh, horrendous, uh, because that means that if this war goes on for a year, there's roughly a 10, I'm going to round it, uh, roughly a 10% risk of use of nuclear weapon, uh, major use of nuclear weapons. Uh, which we can't tolerate that, uh, and we need to bring the war to a rapid conclusion. So how can we bring the war to a rapid conclusion without conceding to Putin, as Herb Lynn sitting back there uh, said earlier this morning, that's the only way to end it. I actually think there are potentially other ways, but we won't go into that, and no one knows for sure. The best way to end this war is to never have started it. And for that, I'm going to go back to October 2013. I was upstairs in the Perry Conference Room, I don't know, I think it was called the Central Conference Room in those days, uh, and Daniel Altman, now a professor, I think, at Georgia Tech, you said, uh, uh, was a new uh, pre-doc here at Stanford, and he asked me what I did. And I told him, uh, I work on um, risk analysis of nuclear deterrence, which is where the 1% a year comes in, but the other thing we do with risk analysis is to look at a catastrophe as an accident chain. It's, you don't just jump there. You, there's a sequence of mistakes that gets you there, just like the Cuban Missile Crisis didn't just happen. There were a sequence of mistakes that got us there. And if we'd gone over the nuclear threshold, World War III wouldn't have just happened. There would have been another sequence of mistakes. Um, and so I told Daniel that I seek out crises before they're recognizable so that we can try to nip them in the bud. Unfortunately, I'm not very successful at that by myself. I hope maybe some of you will uh, have some effect on this. I do talk to members of Congress, uh, people on the National Security Council, although right now it's kind of hard with the Ukrainian situation. We're all focused there. So Daniel told me I should look at Sevastopol 2017, and I had no idea what he was talking about. But I looked it up, and very quickly I realized that 2017 was when the Russian lease on their Black Sea port, their warm water naval port in Sevastopol, came up for renewal, and Yanukovych had extended it, I think in 2012 or something like that. But uh, Timoshenko, who had been uh, uh, the head of Ukraine in 2010, the, she's the one with the braids, had said she'd never extend the lease. She was more of a Ukrainian nationalist, whereas Yanukovych was more of a Russophobe. And I realized that if a new government came to power, uh, that it might abrogate the lease that Yanukovych had extended, and there was no way the Russians would have put up with that. So I started to pay some attention to Ukraine as a potential crisis. Five months later, in February 2014, the stuff hit the fan with the Maidan uh, revolution, or the Russians see it as a coup, and there's a little bit of truth on both sides of that that we won't go into. And so it's too late now to avoid the crisis and the war in Ukraine. But we need to learn from that and start looking for other, other situations. Like Taiwan is one that is not yet a crisis, but it easily could become one. And what could we do to, re, to reduce the risk there? I'm not saying we should, uh, and we should not abandon Taiwan, but we shouldn't encourage Taiwanese independence, which is one of the few, uh, declaration of independence, which is one of the few things that could cause it. Um, I'll end by noting that all this comes under the rubric of rethinking national security, which is my current project. And I'm very pleased that Rose uh, is one of the signers of a statement of uh, summary statement on that, along with uh, Leon Panetta, former Secretary of Defense, uh, Bobby Inman, former uh, Director of NSA, 
And it basically argues that we need to rethink national security in the nuclear age, the age of pandemics, the age of terrorism, the age of cyber attacks, that global national security is becoming synonymous with global security, which fits with the name of the organization sponsoring this event, CSAC. It's the Center for International Security and Cooperation, not the Center for National Security and Cooperation. National security is becoming inseparable from global security. We need to think about how to make that work. And Bill, thank you for your efforts to make that happen. Thank you. It was alluded to earlier that we've had a, an extraordinary group of scholars um, and practitioners meeting today here at CSAC to discuss uh, rethinking global nuclear security. And I want to just give a personal note to answer the question that was asked earlier, but what if Russia uses a nuclear weapon? How should we respond? This will be my personal, not a consensus view of the, of, of the discussion. But if Russia uses a, a nuclear weapon in Ukraine, I have a clear and simple answer. What should we do? It depends. <laughs> depends on what kind of use they have. Depends on the number of people killed. Depends crucially on what our goals are. And what we can't do is think through all the scenarios, but we can think about what our goals should be under those circumstances, and then think through military options and diplomatic options that could have a higher chance of achieving our goals while accepting that this would be a very risky situation regardless of what we did under those circumstances. Three scenarios, one is so-called demonstration strike. What if the Russians use a nuclear weapon over an uninhabited area or even at sea? My view there is that this would not warrant a military response. It would warrant a major diplomatic response throughout the world saying the Russians have crossed a line. They are um, uh, now using nuclear weapons for the first time since 1945 and placed the moral opprobrium that would be appropriate for breaking a nuclear taboo uh, on, on the Russians, but continue fighting the war the way we've been fighting it. I think that's unlikely as a scenario because I think the Russians would believe that demonstrating the use of nuclear weapons in that kind of way would show irresolution on their part rather than resolution. The second I take more seriously, that is the use of a lower yield, so-called tactical, but the strategic effect would be important, a weapon against a military target in Ukraine. And here, I think that if that is done, we should remember that this was a war game that was done in 2016 during the second Obama term in which in that war game, the Russians used a single nuclear weapon against a NATO country. And the deputies to the National Security Council made a decision to respond by attacking inside Russia for the first time in the war game, but using conventional weapons only. The principals, that is the more senior people playing the war game the next day, decided we must respond with nuclear weapons, ordered in the scenario in the war game, the use against the Russian targets from which the attack against NATO had come were told by the red team, the intelligence officers playing the Russians, that if you do that, the Russians are going to respond by attacking the United States. So they decided to use three nuclear weapons and attack Belarus instead. Averill Haynes, the director, the deputy director at the NSC, now obviously the head of US intelligence, was the chief, one of the chief of the deputies. And she had t-shirts printed saying, the deputies had it right. And I think that's true. The deputies thought about escalating, attacking Russia, but de-escalating by using conventional weapons only. And so a principle that we should be thinking about if the Russians do use nuclear weapons against a military target in the Ukraine would be to escalate geographically, potentially, and in terms of direct US involvement, potentially, but de-escalate by keeping it conventional. 
by attacking military targets only, using conventional forces. You can imagine doing this at sea, which would be less escalatory than going inside Russian territory, or doing it along the border, doing it in Ukraine, or doing it in Russia, depending on the nature of the attack. The third, and I would put this a lower probability, but the most tragic would be if the Russians decide to use nuclear weapons against a city. This wouldn't be escalate to de-escalate their doctrine. This would be escalate to intimidate, to try to use nuclear weapons the way we did in 1945, to get a government that is fighting back to give up. And for that, I think we should respond in some of the same ways. We should not automatically do what our habit is in war games, to use nuclear weapons in response, and certainly not use them against a city. But think about conventional options that could escalate geographically, but not escalate, but de-escalate in terms of the kinds of weapons that would be used. And the last point that came through throughout our conversations today is that the best way to prevent these are not by having to think through properly how do we respond if the worst happens, but how to deter this from ever happening. Because all of these options are really risky and really frightening. So one thing I think we should be doing now is privately telling the Russian military that the use of nuclear weapons against the city is a war crime. We have a long history of tracking down war criminals. And the person who would order that has made disastrous decisions for you. Do you really want to follow an order that's a war crime? Follow an order of someone who's made decisions that have led to such a horrible war, and such destruction of the Russian military? How much that would add to deterrence, I don't know. But I hope we should be saying that privately and quietly. And just as the Biden administration prepared the ground for a united front uh, against the Russian aggression by saying that the Russians are planning this, we should be saying, don't, if you are making any plans to use nuclear weapons, this would be a severe and swift response. We should not say what it will be, lest we find ourselves in a commitment trap of having to do something that we really don't want to do. But we shouldn't shy away from saying, the Russians seem to be making threats in this direction, and you should know that our response will be swift and severe. We should avoid the kinds of problems that you're saying when we haven't thought through these options, but we should also be very cautious in not overcommitting to something that we would not want to do if the worst does come about. So I'll conclude there. Um, we've had an extraordinary day here today, and it's, it's been wonderful to have it ended with um, Bill Perry uh, giving both his remarks, but then also getting the Alan Cranston Prize. So thank you, Bill, for all you've done. Thank you. And thank you for everybody who's participating here. We have time for a last round of Q&A to Governor Brown, to Ambassador Gottmuller, to Marty Hellman, Professor Marty Hellman, and of course, to Secretary Bill Perry. So coming in the back. Thanks. Um, Jim Goldgeier, visiting scholar here at CSAC. And I was, thanks so much for all of this, and especially Secretary Perry for your Remarks. I was very interested in your comments about the unfortunate precedents that are being set in the way in which the nuclear threats are being used. I have a question about the rhetoric, um, and the, I think this is particularly for Rose, but anyone is welcome to answer it. I mean, the kind of rhetoric that's come out from a range of individuals in the Moscow elite um, is, I, I don't think we've really seen it from Moscow since late 50s Khrushchev. And you know, talk about you know, eliminating, destroying the UK, and and these other kinds of statements. How damaging do you think that kind of rhetoric is in terms of precedent setting? And does it surprise you, given that we have 
thought that Russia was sort of a responsible nuclear power. I mean, this isn't Kim Jong-un, North Korea, but Russia's, I mean, it seems like it's become a very irresponsible nuclear power, um, at least with respect to the rhetoric. And, and how important do you think that is going forward? That was directed to you, Russell. Thank you, Jim. That is a, an excellent question. There have been two aspects of this crisis that have really concerned me very much. One is this shocking and idiotic nuclear saber rattling that you're pointing to, that shocking video of a nuclear weapon being placed on London, and then the, the newscasters laughing about it in the, in the midst of the newscast. It was shocking and idiotic, but uh, I put the, uh, the Kremlin, President Putin's saber rattling in that same kind of context. It's unnecessary, uh, shocking, idiotic, and I think actually undermines strength of their nuclear deterrent it's like the little boy crying wolf you know after a while and but that's what we're also worried about that they actually could then proceed to some demonstration or other singular use of a, a nuclear weapon so um i uh, that's one aspect of it that's concerned me very much but the other half has been the megaphone diplomacy that was particularly notable in the run-up to the invasion when it became clear, I think, to those of us who have been involved in, in the diplomatic world that, that they weren't really interested in, in finding an off-ramp before the invasion took place. I think a lot of the, the Russian senior figures didn't really think that Putin was gonna go through with the invasion, but nevertheless, to me, the fact that they were just really out there and even leaked the US counterproposals to a major Spanish newspaper, Al País. To, to get it all out there, it meant to me they were not serious about negotiating. So those were two serious, uh, very, very serious problem areas. I think now though, um, there's one uh, phenomenon that's beginning to emerge that is interesting me very much. And that is uh, this kind of uh, more sober tone, even with President Putin in his May Day uh, speech from last week, May 9th, he seemed, a, he seemed a bit more somber, perhaps, not rattling the nuclear saber. And now we're seeing a kind of development of that tonality in other places. Some of you may have seen CNN reporting on this, uh, this military commentator, an ex-colonel, in the last 24 hours talking on uh, Russia One about the limits to their uh, and the failures of their military campaign and the fact that now Russia is fully isolated. So I'm actually very interested to see now whether this more sober and somber uh, public face uh, begins to develop. To me, perhaps that means a readiness to begin a more serious negotiation, but, but we'll have to see. I think <laughs> for me, the jury's very much still out on that, but I do know that it's a different tonality that's emerging. Question here, John. I was wondering if you could speak to the role of missile defense in the shifting nuclear deterrence landscape. Uh, we've seen in recent conflicts that uh, missiles have been shot down effectively by even older generation Soviet um, uh, missile defense systems. So I wonder with NATO and the United States being significantly, am I coming through on the microphone? Yep, yep. Significantly wealthier than Russia, if there might be a temptation among some policymakers to go all in on missile defense and try and restore the ability to act against Russia and um, not be so deterred by um, Putin's threat to use nuclear weapons in response to conventional weapons. If that strategy is pursued, is it likely to be successful? And is it likely to lead to potentially grave miscalculation where we think that we can actually stop a nuclear attack by Russia, but would fail to do so and could lead to uh, significant destruction? Bill, maybe you should answer about your views on missile defense. Well, my my view. You have a microphone here. You are. You're, you're on. You're mic'd. Yeah. Uh, my views are perhaps extreme in this regard, because I believe the thought that we could defend the United States from a massive attack from the Soviet Union is wrong. It's a snare and a delusion. Any missile defense I can conceive of that we would build at 10 times the cost of our present missile defense over many years would not be capable of stopping or even making a significant dent on a, on a determined Soviet attack on the United States. The reason being simply arithmetic that you have to have one interceptor for every missile they fire at, every warhead they fire at you. 
and it's much cheaper and simpler to build many warheads than it is to build many interceptors. And even most importantly, you don't even have to build uh, many more warheads. You have to be, you can multiply them by ten with decoys. The kind of an intercept system we have, which operates in free space, not in the atmosphere, is, e is very easy to build decoys for. So you can simply overwhelm a missile defense with numbers, where the numbers include decoys as well as the warheads you're building. So I don't think it's possible, technically possible, to build an intercept system that could defeat a serious attack from a country as technically advanced as, as uh, Russia. Thank you. Bill, it's Eric Schlosser behind this uh, Hello, Eric. mask. And I, I just, I feel that if you are concerned about the state of the world, then all of us should be 10 times more concerned given your level, rational approach to things. And I'm wondering, uh, do you think that uh, part of Russia's calculation in going into Ukraine was influenced by the manner of our withdrawal from Afghanistan? Because there's been a lot of uh, comment about Putin misunderstanding how the Ukrainians would respond, but do you think that there was a feeling that the United States had been weakened and would be unable to pull together uh, an alliance to oppose uh, the Russian invasion? And that might be true, Eric, but I don't believe that. I believe the I would estimate that the Russians believe that we would not respond to an invasion of Ukraine because of our fear of precipitating a nuclear war, which is what I've, which is what I've talked about today. And that would have nothing to do, wouldn't have to be connected at all with, with uh, the Afghanistan issue. No, I don't think it has anything to do with Afghanistan. I think it has more fundamental than that. Question for, no, right next to you, Eric. That's no, no. Right. Um, Ilmi Granoff. Um, I just wanted to interrogate uh, a statement that Professor Hellman made, but it's an open question to all the panelists. Um, the idea that we're working towards the fastest resolution possible. If you look at the conventional warfare occurring in Ukraine, it seems like the prolongation of the war and the rousing defense by Ukrainians is actually depleting Russians' capability to, um, to even hold territory that they currently have and really plays to the advantage of Ukrainians. And um, further, that Russians' ability to continue to mobilize and replenish their forces is deteriorating because of economic sanctions. And so I'm trying to make sense of what it would mean to accelerate verse it and hasten the end of the war versus what appears to me the advantage and reduced nuclear risk that comes from the continued deterioration of Russia's ability to seriously convey to both the Russian people and to the world that it's able to continue to wage conventional war in Ukraine. So I just want to interrogate that view and sort of see where it leaves us in terms of what we should do with Ukraine. Well, let me clarify. I wasn't, when I said we need to bring it to as rapid conclusion as possible, I didn't say how. I don't know how. And when, and when we discussed this uh, this morning, I said, I pray. I literally do pray because I don't see a good solution. The time to have stopped this war was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, one year ago. I'm not sure we could have. I mean, maybe we're facing a Hitler. Uh, but I'm hoping if we, if we are facing a Hitler, we're sunk. I mean, there's going to, I mean, imagine Hitler with nuclear weapons in 1945, what would have happened? But so the only hypothesis that has any, resol any potentially good resolution to it is that Putin does have a strand of sanity left. He's not really a Hitler. So I'm going to go on that basis, not because I'm sure it's true, but because that's the only one that makes sense. And I don't know, I'm not saying what we should do uh, to bring it to a rapid conclusion, but we should be thinking along those lines. And one of the problems, even before this started, is we think only in terms of deterrence. Um, we don't think in terms of um, 
uh, carrots. And so my wife and I have a book, uh, which Bill very nicely gave us a blurb for. Uh, you said it should be read by a couple seeking peace at home as well as by diplomats seeking peace in the world. <laughs> and there's, if you can download a free PDF from my website. Again, go to Stanford Hellman. It's right up there. Look for book. And um, look for uh, Paul Kennedy, a professor of uh, history at Yale. He has a paper on appeasement that makes the point that appeasement gets a bad reputation based on one data point, uh, Munich 1938. And he explains why Britain repeatedly appeased America in the second half of the 19th century uh, at great, uh, with great success. And uh, we, may, we need to find better words than appeasement for carrots. As long as we call it appeasement, it's going to be uh, denigrated. Anybody else? I would just say that the Ukrainians have a vote in this. Um, you know, this is not up, up to us about when this war ends. And um, the Ukrainians, we should you know, listen very closely to, the, to their views. We want a war to end by Russia losing, but if Putin stays in power, to have at least some off-ramp that he can claim at home that he got, achieved his, his objective. So it doesn't have to be a, a complete uh, loss for them, but that we want the rest of the world to see that he's lost so that the strategic effects of invading your neighbor and killing not just soldiers, but many, many innocent civilians should not be a lesson that other people can learn that they can get away with. And I think the Ukrainians will be tougher than we are in many ways, and they, they've demonstrated that. Um, we do have a great question from Ted Daly, the former staffer for Alan Cranston that came in. So I'll, I'll read this and see who would like to respond. Uh, one thing Ted Daly says that I've heard many times since February 24th is that Ukraine should have kept its nuclear weapons. This is proof that the smart thing to do for any country to do is to retain their nuclear weapons if they have them or to obtain them if they don't have them. That's his rhetorical question. How do we counter this infinitely pernicious logic? Well, perhaps I'll start because it was part of my my comments about the critique of the of the Budapest memorandum, but I do want to underscore the point I made just at the end, and it may have slipped by um, too quickly, and that is that I believe if there had been a continued dispersal of the Soviet former Soviet nuclear arsenal among those four countries, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Russia, that we would have seen a long period of nuclear destabilization going on in Europe from the end of the Soviet Union, perhaps even till the coming day, and that the chances of a nuclear conflict uh, on European territory or the um, phenomenon of loose nukes, nuclear terrorism, nuclear weapons or fissile material falling into the hands of terrorists at a time when Al Qaeda was just uh, gathering steam. And uh, so I do believe that, uh, the f and we need to get that argumentation out there, but it's a subtle argument and it's difficult for people to understand. But in the end of the day, the basic point is that nuclear weapons do not buy you security and stability, they buy you insecurity and instability. And I think that point we somehow need to get out there at the present time because there are enormous horizontal escalation pressures uh, arising from this crisis. Uh, the questioner is absolutely right about that. And uh, so we need to be thinking about the most effective arguments to, to counter that kind of, that kind of uh, real, I would say, uh, certainty on uh, the part of, of a number of observers of what's happening today in Ukraine. Question from Zoom for Governor Brown. Governor Brown, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Great. How does the war in Ukraine play into American domestic politics? Is the Biden administration doing a, a good enough job that this will um, not hurt or even help the Democrats? Or is this going to help the Republicans because of concerns that Bi B Biden's uh, administration was not strong enough uh, to prevent this? Thoughts on domestic politics in the Ukraine war? Well, I think the domestic politics are bad enough just with inflation 
uh, with the uh, confusion uh, uh, at the departure from Afghanistan and the low poll numbers that have Biden uh, no higher than 41 or 42 percent with a negative disapproval rating of about uh, 54. So that 12 point deficit has been stuck in place uh, for many, many months. So I'd say that's a big problem. Now, uh, Ukraine uh, voters uh, don't get into the nuance. And uh, the, the general impression is Ukraine's a problem. Now, there's some enthusiasm that comes from telling around the chief, but I've seen no impact uh, on, on Biden's popularity uh, of his, you know, strong, uh, you know, resolute uh, opposition to Putin and his invasion. So in terms of the, uh, the House and the Senate, uh, hard to say. I'd say uh, the Republicans are saying the same thing as the Democrats, except for uh, uh, Rand Paul and, and 43 other Republicans who are taking a more um, isolationist or a more contrary position about uh, aid to NATO. So, and I would predict that, that um, if the Republicans do succeed and depending on who gets elected president, if there is a Republican, there'll be a move to um, somehow uh, blame the war on the Democrats, much as the uh, Korea was blamed on us, uh, on the Democrats. And, um, that, and Eisenhower ran, in effect, as a peace candidate, saying we're bringing, he was a general, so he could do that. Uh, but no, I don't see the Ukraine is, is an existential threat to the world, uh, to the immediate threat to Ukrainians and the Russians who are themselves are getting killed, the Russian soldiers who have really very little to say, have nothing to say about it. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't try to think too much about the politics. Right now, uh, how can America push back Putin without driving him to nuclear or making things worse or make things better? And uh, so, so far, things have worked better than anyone expected. And uh, possibly there's tactical moves and money and weapons that can be uh, provided that with the courage of the Ukrainians and the ineptness to the Russians, uh, maybe uh, this can get to a stalemate and some kind of a ceasefire. Um, I don't think the, the uh, example in Korea is too promising. Uh, that war went on for a year and a half after uh, there was an attempt to uh, stop, the, uh, stop the fighting. So we're in a very bad situation. As somebody said, this problem uh, had to be solved many years prior. Uh, we didn't, uh, or it didn't happen, because these things are all uncertain. Uh, so, but forget the politics. The politics are bad for Democrats. Ukraine is not helping Democrats as far as I can see. They're all running over there. Uh, Congressman Pelosi went there and McConnell went as well. So they're all, they're all jumping on the, on the bandwagon. So I think that's a, a neutral in terms of the uh, congressional and presidential election to a detriment for the Democrats. That would be my but I think that's the least of our worries right now. I think the, the, the people who are being killed and the threat, uh, the larger threat of, of uh, conflict. That, that's what I would uh, hope our people are working on 24 seven to uh, minimize. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Brown. Question in the back. It's great to have students here. If you could introduce yourself. I'm, it's on. I don't know if it's on. Oh, now it is. Um, hi, my name is Jenna. I'm a freshman in Dr. Sagan's class. Um, so I spent significant time in Russia, specifically at MGIMOL, which is a university affiliated with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so I've seen firsthand how significant and strong nationalism is in Russia among the general population as well. Um, whereas I think it's fairly clear that the level of nationalism in the United States is much lower. Um, to what extent do you think that this nationalism, specifically in the Russian population, is playing into the war and maybe even supporting Russia's continued aggression in Ukraine? We did talk some about this today. I, I think it's not only Russian nationalism as in patriotism, but it's this historic sense of Russia as the leader of, of the Slavic brethren, the family of Slavic nations, and this recreation of the Slavic heartland with the seizure of Ukraine that was supposed to be bringing the little brothers back home again, right? So it, it is a long standing thread of, of historical analysis as well that 
that informs this kind of, we, we had a lot of discussion about the interaction with the Orthodox Church. I can't begin to reproduce the richness of our discussion today. Jonathan Granoff was contributing a lot as well as the other members. But I think it goes beyond how we think about nationalism, which is related to America's greatness, the patriotism, the, the founding fathers and, and the whole uh, panoply of institutions and documents that goes with that, our Declaration of Independence and Constitution. It's a very secular you know, kind of approach to, to nationhood. And in Russia, it's all intertwined with history, culture, religion, and everything else. But this notion of the, of the Slavic heartland and trying to recreate that is, is something we very much discussed. And I, I'm interested if we have one second to ask the question back, did you see it among your young colleagues? Uh, the fellow students at Nagimo, was it as strong there? Or did they have more of a, a wide-ranging worldview, would you say? Um, well, it's difficult to say. I was in like a Russian program. I, I am Russian, so I did the language program and all of that. Um, I would say a lot of them are, but a lot of them are also children of diplomats and Duma members, et cetera, et cetera. So they're likely to be maybe more patriotic than the average Russian civilian. But as a whole, I think, uh, patriotism has been very ingrained, um, even in the education system and the culture as a whole. So it's very difficult to grow up in Russia and not feel that level of patriotism, no matter what social bracket that you're in. Thank you. I wanted to give one quick comment on your excellent question, Jenna. Um, the polls have been very disturbing, uh, reporting on Russian popular support for the military operation in, in Ukraine. Most polls saying 70, 80% of the public is supporting him. But we know that people in Russia and elsewhere um, tell pollsters what they think they're supposed to say when they're worried about potential repercussions of saying something publicly. So um, about a month ago, a very clever uh, set of German academics got through the Russian system what was called a list poll that lists for one representative sample four different items and doesn't ask people which ones do they agree with but of these four items how many of them do you agree with and then it has for the other group the same four items you think we should spend more on social programs etc cetera, etc cetera, and then added a fifth one which is do you support the military operation in ukraine and the difference between the number of people who voted for four and one and the people who voted for four and the other is something about how many people actually opposed the, the um, war in, in Ukraine. And that showed the good news is that 50% of the public did not support, but done in that clever way of measuring. Um, the bad news is that 50% of the public still supported. So at least that's some evidence that um, this is not just rally around the flag effects. It's not just patriotism, but it's also some of the support is because people are really scared to say that they don't support this today. So, Scott, do you, have any, do you know what the polls were in 2003 around the invasion of Iraq? Because I'd suspect that more than 50% of Americans approved that. So while nationalism here is not the same as nationalism in Russia, nationalism uh, is a problem. Patriotism is good. Um, Leon Panetta wrote to me um, when I was uh, a little while back, he was talking about E.B. White, who is better known as the author of Charlotte's Web. But it, he was saying, it actually got me to look something up, and uh, so, someone wrote of E.B. White, uh, his, na his patriotism was unquestionable, his nationalism non-existent. And I think that's what we need, is more patriotism and less go-go nationalism. Let's, you know, go team. Jonathan, last question. Do we have a microphone? Can we have a microphone up front here, please? Right here. It's a great segue. Uh, one of the questions that was raised in our discussion that Dr. Hellman raised was, can you have national security without global security in today's world? Governor Brown raised the issue of planetary realism. Uh, the United Nations has a whole human security section posing the issue at a national level, can we protect the oceans, which gives us 50 to 70% of our oxygen? Can we address pandemics? Can we protect the climate of the planet? And the answer to those questions is no, we can't. It doesn't mean 
that we need to do away with national security, but it means we need to have another dimension that puts science and our realistic relationship to the natural world as essential, because that's existential. And in the long term, nuclear weapons don't fit into a planetary realism or a human security paradigm. In fact, they institutionalize adversity and are a hurdle to our common security and the need to cooperate. That to me is the long term. And we need, given that the current regime of respect for the limitations of international law has been somewhat shredded, as, as, as Dr. Perry pointed out, by the invasion, it seems we need a North Star to get out of the chaos for the long term. And I would propose that planetary realism, human security, a global approach is essential. That's the long term. The short term, and this is a question, is for the short term, would it be beneficial? This was raised in our discussion and it had a lot of resonance. Would it be beneficial to have a Security Council resolution prohibiting the use of nuclear weapons against any non-nuclear weapon state, such as the Ukraine? That take nuclear weapons out of the equation in the Ukraine crisis. That's a question for all the panelists. Well, that was discussed this morning. That's right? with us, but this is no, so actually. I, I'll summarize. I don't, I'll summarize what, what was said by there are a number of very good people. People thought it would be a, a good idea, as I heard it. Uh, Russia would veto it, but you could get either a, a, a Security Council resolution modulo Russia or a uh, um, uh, general assembly. What's, what's General, General, assembly. General, assembly. General Assembly resolution that would pass overwhelmingly, which would make it clear to Russia that do, doing what it's doing, threatening what it's threatening, is not acceptable. Is it, did anybody else hear it differently this morning? That was a good discussion, I would say. I would just add one extra point here is that um, whether the UN is the right place to do this or not is not clear to me. But what is clear is that the Russians, along with the United States, have already made a what's called a negative security assurance through the non-proliferation treaty review process that we would not use nuclear weapons against a, um, a non-nuclear weapon state that is in compliance with its nuclear non-proliferation commitments. Non commitments. Yeah, it's not commitments um, we should be reminding the Russians of that. We have the, um, in August, the all members of the non-proliferation treaty will come together to review how well the treaty is doing. There'll be many controversies, not just because of the war in, in Ukraine, but for other reasons. And I think that will certainly be a place, whether the United States has planned for it or not, it's going to happen, and that will be a, a, a major issue. So I think it would be good to get the Russians to commit there um, uh, and doing it in a way that has been done in the past rather than confronting them at the UN may, may be a, a more diplomatic way of going. Um, but that's just my opinion and not the opinion of everybody in, in the room. Bill. I agree with you, Tukar. Yeah. <laughs> well, let, let me just um, conclude by, by saying that you know, among the great joys of being at um, Stanford University is seeing um, the students come out for events like this, to see the local community, uh, to see a huge Zoom audience that we have today, but also to spend time with Bill Perry. So let's um, give a final round of applause to you guys today. <laughs> so thank you and good evening.